All right. Well, here we go. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research uh, Think and Drink series of virtual talks. Uh, I'm so glad that you're here, and I hope uh, that all of you are as well and healthy as any of us could possibly be uh, given these weird conditions, uh, including a minute ago uh, here in Laramie, Wyoming, something that looked like thunder snow. So if the world could get even more apocalyptic than maybe it has been lately, I think we've just achieved it. Uh, I'm Scott Hinkle. I'm the director of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research, and I am thrilled to introduce you to our speakers tonight on the topic of women and Wyoming's politics. Our speakers are Tara Nethercott, who is a Wyoming native and a graduate of the University of Wyoming Law School. She's a practicing attorney and owns a small business law firm in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Tara was elected to the Wyoming Senate in 2016. She is the Senate Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and she also serves on the Corporations and Elections Committee, as well as the Blockchain Task Force. Key legislation that Tara has successfully sponsored is for allowing community colleges to offer Bachelor of Applied Sciences degrees, as well as providing mental injury coverage to first responders. Welcome. And Becca Smith, who has been director of the Wyoming Women's Foundation since 2018 and with the foundation since 2012. The Wyoming Women's Foundation is an organization whose mission is to help women achieve economic self-sufficiency and provide opportunities for girls. She has an educational background in biology, art, and law. Welcome. Thank you. And Brittany Wallach, who is a Cheyenne native, a UW graduate, and she is the founder and executive director of Black Dog Animal Rescue. She is currently running for the state legislature, Senate District 6. Brittany is passionate about a great many causes, chief among them women's rights and gender equality, and the critical role nonprofit organizations play in supporting a healthy economy. And I should say to those listening, should you wish to follow who's ever speaking at the moment in your upper right hand corner, you can press speaker view and just see one person at a time, or you can press that same button again for gallery view and then see all of our speakers at the same time. So I'm gonna ask a few questions and uh, then I'm gonna open it up for the audience. The, uh, for people who are joining us, if you wish, you can type in a question or a comment into the chat function uh, and all of us will see it here. You could also type in down at the bottom here, there is a Q&A button and you can press that and you can send a question or a comment uh, just to us panelists. So let's start. Please just share with us your views. What has shaped your views about your work, your place in the community, and your political aspirations, please? Well, I'll go ahead and start. Since uh, as an elected senator, I get these questions a lot as part of the stump speech, which is really one of the hardest parts about being in elected office is, why did you run and, and who are you, quite essentially? So. Um, throughout the years been able to develop that a little bit more. So why do I care about women's issues in Wyoming? Why did I choose to run for office? Why am I a lawyer? What shaped who I am? And I think it's probably what shaped uh, most of us on the panel and most of our listeners and well, as well, which is that rugged Wyoming pioneering drive. I'm a Wyoming native, I think like most of you on the panel and probably the listeners as well. And as we know from being those Wyoming natives, we learn to be tenacious, to have grit, to be independent and strong. And we're raised in an environment that encourages equality most of the time uh, based on our history. And I think it's important and important for me to remember that history as it shapes our future as well. As we were the first to pass women's right to vote and hold office, we also passed equal pay um, and so I think those are really, and for women to, to be landowners and to own property. So we were pretty progressive. And I think that history continues um, with challenges to overcome, but I do think it continues. And you can see some of that grit and tenacity in all of us, including me. I can go next. Um, and as Scott mentioned, I'm the director of the Wyoming Women's Foundation. So 
I'm coming at this from a slightly different perspective from the other two panelists um, in some ways, uh, since I'm not seeking or in elected office. Um, and really our, um, our, the way that we relate to politics is through advocacy. And so part of our uh, work is to provide some education to our elected officials and our local um, decision makers. And so that's one way that the Women's Foundation, um, you know, has brought me closer to politics. Um, and as a 501c3, we don't, you know, support any particular candidate, of course, but um, we are interested in women um, in elected positions in general because just of the, um, the way that leadership um, certainly affects uh, economic self-sufficiency for women and um, just due to the fact that in Wyoming uh, women are underrepresented and we'd like to see um, a better representation of our actual uh, population here. Um, and as far as community involvement that has kind of shaped our work as well, um, we do we make grants to other organizations in Wyoming that are helping to achieve that mission of helping women achieve economic self-sufficiency and provide opportunities for girls. So um, some of those are through leadership and mentoring um, and some of them are through advocacy. And then um, we also have kind of an income and asset development track. Um, so those are some of the ways that, that I touch on you know, politics and women in Wyoming. Uh, one of the one of the things I always start with when I'm introducing myself is talking about um, kind of the conditions under which I grew up and how that helped shape my worldview of women in leadership. And I did grow up in a single parent household with a very strong uh, mother who holds no shortage of leadership credentials herself. Um, and really the support network for that family was was very much comprised of other women in the community so always in my life my worldview has really focused on the leadership strengths and the the unique characteristics of women in leadership roles so that's been a, a driving factor in my own leadership style and growth um, and you know i started a black dog animal rescue in 2008 and since that time have gotten very involved with the nonprofit sector all over the state of Wyoming and that has given me a front row seat to the work that we do with some of our most marginalized communities. Um, so through that viewpoint and my own work as a citizen advocate with the legislature, I really come to shape some of my, my positions and my uh, my perception of the role that the state's leadership has in supporting some of our most marginalized or most uh, disenfranchised populations. And uh, certainly you see what happens when you have an imbalance of perspective uh, or an imbalance of diversity in, the, in our state's leadership. And so that has become very apparent to me and is a primary motivating factor in trying to help contribute to some of that diversity, both of voice and um, gender. All three of you have touched in, in your own ways on that imbalance question. So Wyoming's population is about evenly split. I think, uh, what, 49% women and 51% men. Uh, but I think the number is only 16% of the available seats in the legislature are held by women. What do you think, what do you think led to that disparity and what, if anything, should be done about it? Uh, I'll jump in here on this one. Um, first of all, I think it's important to realize that 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 ratio has been in decline. So there were times in our history where that representation was better. Uh, but certainly since about the mid 90s that that has gone down and down further and further where there there are fewer and fewer women in our elected offices so i think that we can look at what has been done historically to promote women in elected offices and what some of the systemic or structural changes have been since then that have prohibited women from uh, entering uh, into the the race 
Um, but the other thing that I, that I know through some experiences that, you know, I spent about two years with Leadership Wyoming really diving into this topic about what is our, what is the problem that's prohibiting women from getting into office. Um, and I think that a lot of it is, uh, you know, sort of the expectation of the role that women continue to play in society. And a lot of it is um, just sort of an unwillingness to elect women for various reasons. Uh, and I think also the, the thing that we are lacking is women sort of supporting and building each other up and bringing each other along into that. So there's a, a mentoring or recruitment aspect that we're lacking, I think, that's contributing to a lot of these problems. I, I would respond to that and just share that my experience running for office um, was not motivated by gender nor was it really even part of any consideration that I made when deciding to run for office. Uh, I wasn't preoccupied with it, nor was I concerned. As a good lawyer and, and a type A type, I did do some research to see what um, the data showed for women running for office and what was important to constituents and what challenges women might uniquely face. My um, review of that data indicated that women need to be both likable and competent in the eyes of a constituent or a voter, where the data indicates maybe a man just needs to be competent. Uh, and so I was very much aware of that. Um, but what does that mean really to be likable and competent? I think most politicians probably are both. They need to be, right? In order to um, have people be attracted to them and, and have their support. My experience campaigning was positive. Uh, I received very little negativity, and by very little in comparison to the overall number of doors that I reached um, and the response that I received, the negative interaction that I would attribute to gender was 1%. Um, and I think there are other factors that contributed to maybe that response associated with those voters as opposed to just systemic gender discrimination. So my message to women who are listening and interested in running for office is to know that, at least in Laramie County, my experience has been very positive and supportive. Uh, obviously, I was successful. And so the voters of Laramie County have indicated time and time again um, across all of the Senate districts and many of the House districts that they're willing to support women. And we get elected and even to um, our opponents who were not women, uh, but were white men. And so being able to see that happen, um, I think should signal that Wyoming is willing to vote for women. And, and that's a good thing for the state. I'll talk about it from um, the perspective of someone who, you know, hasn't run my, you know, I haven't run a campaign, but um, I've done, you know, a lot of, I've had a lot of discussions about this with other women in the state and with other organizations um, that are, that would like to see more women elected, such as the Wyoming Women's Legislative Caucus and um, some other women that, that network um, through an event called Leap into Leadership that a lot of you, I'm sure, are aware of. Um, and what, what I hear pretty often is that when women run, they win at the same um, rate that men do, but just not as many women are running. And um, so, the other two panelists have, have touched on some of the reasons for that. Um, and I would also add to the reasons that for our legislature, um, we're one of a handful of states that still has a citizen legislature. And so we're a part-time um, legislature where it makes it a little difficult for just anyone to run and to think about serving in the legislature because um, they need to most likely have another job so I think that you need to either have a job where you're able to take the time off that's needed to be there for the session and to travel around the state for um, committee meetings. Um, so a lot of people might be self-employed that are working or that are elected or um, you know, they might have a very flexible employer or they might just have the, the funds or be retired. Um, and so that, that does eliminate the possibility for a lot of women, I think, that are needing to support their family or that a family that needs two full incomes. Um, so I just kind of wanted to put that out there as one reason. I've also had a discussion um, with a colleague about fundraising. And I don't know 
um, you know, how important that is to everyone's campaign, but a lot of people that do need to, to spend money to get elected um, when they are fundraising, it can be a little bit more difficult statistically for women to, to raise as much funds for a political campaign. And so they're having to work harder for, you know, for the same amount of money, which isn't, um, you know, a, an unfamiliar concept to women in Wyoming a lot of times. But um, so that those are a couple of things. Um, the other thing that, that occurred to me is that nationally anyway, there's a higher um, percentage of women that run um, that are Democrats. And so in Wyoming, uh, where we're predominantly a Republican state, I, I don't know that, um, you know, those women who are Democrats might, they may choose not to run or, or feel like their, um, their chances aren't as good if they're not a Republican. So um, that's something else that, that could be a contributing factor. I, I think that that's true. Um, after having been elected and participating in some of the national conversations with um, elected women across the country. I, I am pretty rare nationally to be a Republican woman elected, um, sometimes referred to as a unicorn, that it is uh, significantly more common for women to be Democrats. And so that's, I think, a unique um, concept and conversation for the state and the country to have about that. Um, touching on the challenges associated, I think, with choosing to run for office and what Rebecca identified as the numbers are not the same, but the data does show that when women run, they do get elected, but they're just not choosing to run at the rates that men are. And so why is that? And I think some of the things Rebecca also touched on, which is financial and familial commitments can really inhibit that in a very significant way, particularly in a state like Wyoming, where the capital is in a pretty isolated location of the state. And so, and it also happens during a school year. So if you are a mother um, and you have children in school, you know, you have to serve and be away from home for a couple of months at a time. And the likelihood of you being able to go home on weekends or to see your child on any regular basis is really not likely or very, very difficult. And so I think there is, um, I think it is disparate for those women in the other areas of the state that have children at home or families for them to be able to serve effectively, and, and that is a concern. I also think similarly to why we have our wage disparity, not only in Wyoming, which is more significant than the rest of the country, but even across the country in total, has to do with women's inability, uh, or not inability, but um, not necessarily applying for the jobs that they want because of maybe some insecurity about whether or not they feel qualified or not, where men don't, I think, experience that same challenge. I think the data bears that out. And so when it comes to running for office, I think some of those same challenges might present themselves for some women. I'm not qualified. I don't feel like I could do that. Or maybe men don't struggle with some of those same uh, self-doubt that some of the women might. I think all of this is true, Tara. And I I also appreciate you offering perspective that your campaign was a largely positive experience. Um, part of the, the piece that we have left out so far of this discussion is really the fact that women, I think, need much more of like a broad coalition of support to get to the point where they're willing to run, where they feel the confidence to. Um, sometimes I, I Obviously, that's not applicable to every female candidate, but certainly in many, many conversations I've had around the state with a lot of women who have run or were thinking about it and didn't, uh, that coalition of support before they ever uh, made the decision to run was very important for them. And so I think one of the other things that we need to consider as people in positions of leadership or people who are interested in helping to cultivate more female candidates is how can we create that network of support for women and can we make create some kind of systemic process or procedure that leap into leadership is one step in that direction uh, where we're actively recruiting women and supporting them through that so that they feel empowered to make a run uh, when when they've got that network of support surrounding them. Brittany, I have a question for you. Um, were you asked to run? I was not, no. Um, but I did have a great many conversations about 
uh, you know, the possibility of running for a very long time, several years before really taking the leap. Um, so I would definitely count myself among that cohort of women who sort of like put my toe in the water and waited for some feedback before, before taking the leap. And, and it took a while to sort of be convinced that it was, it was time and it was feasible and that there was going to be the, the network available to do it. And we, you know, we just had this discussion about the party disparity in the state. And as a Democratic candidate, um, I could tell you that a great many people suggested that I ought to run as a Republican, uh, as though that would be, uh, it would be completely a done deal if I did that. Um, and I think that, you know, there's, there's definitely another narrative or dialogue going on here that that uh, suggests you must meet a certain sort of litmus test of criteria in order to be a successful candidate. And we need to be able to break that down so that we can get women who don't subscribe to all of those uh, values or all of those um, check boxes, but still have the competency or the capability or the desire to do it. So we have many questions uh, in our chat and our Q&A already. Uh, and I'm going to invite our audience members to continue to make those comments, uh, should you wish. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm just going to go right over to all that. And I'm going to read it, uh, because I want to get the quotes right. Uh, an article in Forbes magazine uh, caught my attention uh, last week. And this article had the title, What do countries with the best coronavirus responses have in common? Women leaders. The article notes that these women leaders are showing characteristics of telling the truth, leading with decisiveness, using appropriate technology, and showing both love and empathy. And it ends with the following comment. Quote, there have been years of research timidly suggesting that women's leadership styles might be different and beneficial. Instead, too many political organizations and companies are still working to get women to behave more like men if they want to lead or succeed. Yet these national leaders are case study sightings of the leadership traits men may want to learn from women. It's time we recognized it and elected more of it." Close quote. How would you respond to that? <clears throat> well, candidly, uh, I, I did read that article and I found it really compelling and really wonderful, most notably the country of Taiwan, which has been, I think, the standout country in the world for its response to the pandemic and to COVID-19. It was the first country in the world really to identify that, uh, of what was going on in Wuhan and sent their own team of scientists and experts to Wuhan to get real data um, that was their own to, to get an understanding of what was happening. They responded immediately and swiftly um, as many of you may know, Wyoming has a strong relationship with Taiwan. We have a trade office there. And so during this past legislative session, we had members from the Taiwanese delegation come speak to us and they encouraged us to respond quickly and swiftly as well in light of what they were already seeing in February and March and, and what they had experienced. And they have a woman prime minister. And so I, I think um, she used the tools and they had that leadership and that respect and that experience as well. Their proximity to China and the previous SARS outbreaks really lended itself to using, um, historically they have not fared well um, in responding to, to the SARS viruses that are new and they decided to make a difference and not, not uh, have the same uh, events that happened to them historically happen in the future. And so under um, their prime minister, who's a female whose name I will not attempt to butcher, um, they have successfully navigated the pandemic and in cl such close proximity to China, that's just really compelling. And they haven't used any forced measures or draconian measures that would maybe be an, a, an affront to our democratic ideals. And so really a country to look to as an example um, that's very different than ours in many ways, but one that has a close relationship and association to our country and to Wyoming. So much to think about there. Personally, in that article, um, the... Uh, the assertion that um, women are encouraged to be more like men in their ways, that has not worked well for me, uh, in fact. So I come from a family of, of uh, very influential older brothers and 
they had a huge influence on my life and my communication style, I would say, is more male oriented. Um, it's much more direct style of communication. That is not what um, anyone um, wants to see from a woman, no matter whether she's an office or not. And so my own experience, whether it be in the courtroom litigating or whether it be as a candidate or on the session floor, they prefer actually in my experience to have maybe a softer side um, and don't want to see the more um, aggressive or edgy or assertive even as an elected official. So, so the assertion that um, trying to make women more man-like, uh, for lack of a better term, I don't think is accurate. Not in my experience. I, my experience with um, this article, which I also read, um, my thought was, again, over the lens of economic self-sufficiency for women. And so I, I like to see different leadership styles um, showcased and uh, kind of getting some cultivation and acceptance um, just to, to get a broader definition of what a leader looks like. So, um, you know, the, the next generation or younger um, women and minorities coming up have a view of what it looks like to be a leader. And it's not just um, the, you know, the white male who needs to control the situation um, or, you know, respond in the typically uh, stereotypically male way. So um, I, I thought it was a good article and, a, you know, a good observation. Um, I think some people might respond to um, the qualities as being stereotypically women, but I, I knew, know that um, certainly every woman's an individual. And you know, as, as Tara mentioned, you know, she's her past experience doesn't necessarily um, put her in the category of, of responding in those ways immediately. But I guess um, you know, with the research saying that kind of overall, that those are some typical um, qualities that are seen or with women, but not exclusively with women either. So I think it also gives men, um, it certainly gives men the, the go ahead to use some of those qualities more, um, more often. That, that was a challenge that I had in reading the article is it, it almost reads as though um, the, the qualities that they were highlighting in these female leaders, such as decisiveness or empathy uh, or compassion are exclusive to women. And I would say that that is not true. Although to Becca's point, it is stereotypically expected. Um, I think that those characteristics make for strong leadership skills. Um, and that maybe the dialogue that we have in this country fails to recognize that sometimes. Um, these are qualities that are often looked at as sort of a softer skill set um, and maybe not uh, held in as high esteem. But what we can see is during something that's scary and unknown, uh, leaders who are able to acknowledge that, are they able to acknowledge their own vulnerability or put themselves on the same sort of feeling, thinking plane as the people that they're serving, can really be effective in inspiring uh, some more confidence and some more empathy from the people that they're serving. And I think that is why those women were highlighted because those are the skills that they employed. But it's probably not accurate to assume that men are incapable of demonstrating these same characteristics. I'm glad you all read the article and I totally agree. Men are of course capable of demonstrating those characteristics, but many of the men that we have in leadership right now are not demonstrating those characteristics. The other part of the article that I mentioned is that many male authoritarian or populist leaders right now are handling the situation much more poorly than many of the women leaders. So uh, if it is true that men can also display these characteristics, one hopes to see them very soon in our male leaders, yes? Yes. One thing that uh, stuck out to me about um, another article that was linked to that one, um, which was about some of the seven leadership skills that, they, that uh, women could teach to men or men could learn from women, um, was the focus on elevating others that uh, women sometimes have. And I think that has kind of changed a bit because I think in the past there was sometimes a competitive nature between women and that happens. But 
I've been really um, encouraged by the community that, that I've encountered in Wyoming of women who are leaders and who are um, there to provide mentorship and um, that they really do embody that elevating others um, focus. And I think that that is really something that's going to be um, helpful, like, you know, with future generations for for them to pursue leadership positions for, for women to to break through a little bit more into to some of these representation, um, you know, to, to be more represent, representative of our population. You know, that same article, I, I read it today, Becca, too, from the Harvard Business Review, and it has this, this summary of like seven characteristics of women that we uh, see in leadership. And a couple of them that stood out to me really uh, and I think speak to this point and why these female leaders are doing so well is because women actually much more often have to prove themselves in leadership before they ever get to a leadership role. And I don't think that the same is always true for men. Uh, they have this discussion about leadership effectiveness versus emergence. So uh, men have often a much easier time finding themselves into a leadership position or just declaring themselves membership of a leadership elite without ever having to or feeling compelled to prove that skill set uh, or develop it along the way. And I understand that when I say these things, they sound like broadly sweeping generalizations. And I need to say, you know, that I understand that that's not true. But statistically, data does show that it can be true. Women are going to expect of themselves far more experience, far more successes uh, as, they, as they pursue uh, higher and higher roles in leadership. And a lot of that is going to require them to develop a higher emotional intelligence to cultivate these um, skills and empathy and compassion uh, that people in other positions or, or men sometimes maybe are not called to or uh, tested to prove before they get to the same position. I think it, yeah, it does kind of go back to what Tara said earlier about women not feeling as confident to to take that step um, as early as you know a lot of men might. So I agree. Yeah, that is what the data suggests when it relates to um, wage disparity and and therefore also job title position disparity. So the higher level positions obviously get paid more, and so that contributes to that wage disparity and women are um, haven't proven that leadership effectiveness yet perhaps and so they don't even apply where their male counterparts just go ahead and apply regardless if they've proven that leadership effectiveness so I think that data uh, applies to both um, the workplace and into politics I would just say in relationship to the allegation that men um, and the empathy piece you know, my experience on the legislative floor, on the session floor in the Senate, you know, I have seen time and time again, my fellow senators become appropriately passionate and emotional and empathetic over a variety of issues. Um, and so, again, that is my Wyoming Senate experience. And it hasn't all been rosy, make no, make no mistake. There have been some dark days and days I have been disappointed about, but that's to be expected. But um, as a whole, I can look to all of my 29 colleagues and, and identify strong traits of empathy uh, and leadership and compassion. And, and they express them um, emotionally, physically, as well as verbally. And I think that's important as well for the audience um, to hear. On that, and on your first point uh, about wages, our very first question in the chat uh, is from Robin, uh, who writes, uh, what an incredible panel. I would like to hear the panelists' views on pay equity issues in Wyoming. Is there one in terms of equal pay for equal experience and background? And if so, what should we be doing to address the issue? Thank you, she writes. There is. <laughs> there is a major disparity between equal pay and equal position, um, and it needs to be remedied as quickly as possible. Uh, when I have this conversation with women, um, I just say look inward instead of looking outward, and I want you to focus on applying for the job that you want and asking for a raise immediately. 
those are the two pieces I really focus in on. Um, I, I think we also look at why women don't apply for those jobs, you know, for those reasons we discussed. They're also not asking and negotiating for a raise. Those are skills that maybe um, we don't teach uh, younger women or women in different positions that are uh, paid less. And so those are skills and conversations that are hard to have, right? It's hard to go and ask for something you want. You might be rejected. You might be told no. You don't quite know how to ask for it. And so you just don't. And so ask for a raise. Everyone ask for a raise. <laughs> It'll help our numbers and I want that to happen. Uh, you know, additionally, we have um, the access to, or not we have access to education here but uh, women are not obtaining um, degrees and education at the same rate as men are bachelor's degrees interestingly enough more women in wyoming have some college than men um, but the type of finished completed degrees that they're getting are not the higher wage paying jobs engineers those stem degrees like our good uh, Brittany wallish has um, she has one of those um, coveted stem degrees that we're trying to increase those numbers for women. And I think that's part of moving that dial into kind of create that gender um, to, to alleviate that gender disparity when it comes to compensation. Tara, I'd just like to ask you a question to that point. Um, women have this problem everywhere. These are nationwide trends. So how come the gender pay gap is, is worse in Wyoming? And does the state have a role in helping to control for this? And what is your opinion on that? Well, I think the important, the state does have a role in controlling for that. We are the equality state. It's important we continue to drive that. We want all um, working people to be paid equally. That was important to us in 1869. It's as equally important to us today. So understanding why, uh, so that we can create the right solutions, right? Is it systemic gender discrimination? And I don't know that that's the case. Certainly, um, that's part of it, but I don't think that's the driving factor. I think it does have to do with poverty. I think it has to do with um, families. I think it has to do with access to education. You know, in our rural areas in the community, they're not heading off to the University of Wyoming and going to go get their bachelor's degree, master's degree in engineering, right? Uh, they have different challenges and different commitments at that time. One of the reasons why um, I'm really so proud of that bachelor's degree for the community college is allowing that next level educational opportunity right there in a classroom in their own rural communities. So I am hopeful that that actual um, legislation will help move that dial with um, educational attainment and job opportunity that they didn't have previously. And so providing those opportunities for women to better themselves um, and men as well, right? So one of the reasons why I think men make more money is because right out of high school, they can go work um, in our extraction industries that pay an incredible amount of money for women, I think are generally speaking less likely to do so. And so there's an automatic wage disparity even for those, um, that population that's not seeking a higher education. So I think that's part of the conversation. The state does have a role. So do we as citizens um, and so do we as women to help drive that conversation. So creating that network to encourage them how to ask for a raise I think is the start. <laughs> that there's you know some opportunity for women to uh, ask for a raise and to to advocate for themselves um, and each other and um, you know there's also some other factors um, for instance well the women's foundation this february we re released uh, a study called the self-sufficiency standard and one of the things that we were able to do was look at um, what it takes for a family to survive of it's broken down by um, your family type and where you live. Um, but we, this is the fourth time it's been calculated for Wyoming. And so we were able to look at how um, the cost of living has changed in Wyoming since 2005 when it was first calculated um, using just the same methodology. And, you know, what the study showed was that the wages have gone up at a much lower rate than the cost of living. And so, um, you know, that is exacerbated for women if they're paid less, right? So um, I think that just looking at wages and making sure that people are being paid what um, for the work that they're being done, and in particular in um, jobs that are dominated by women, you know, like 
certain um, healthcare jobs, for instance, uh, tend to be dominated by women in teaching professions, and just making sure that those jobs are kind of, you know, being paid what, what the value, the true value of them is. I think it's important too, just to realize that, you know, to Tara's point about where the young men go to these extractive industries and we still, the women are staying back in these sort of lower wage or minimum wage jobs. Um, and those jobs are being fulfilled largely by women of color uh, and by not having a, su a supportive network in place for helping eliminate or narrow that wage gap, I think that the state does have some responsibility for continuing to perpetuate some of those class problems, just knowing what the, what the likely trajectory for people uh, is going to be in terms of the job availability to them, the jobs that they're likely to take, uh, what their experiential learning in those positions is going to be. Um, and I think, you know, that's one of the reasons that we have to look at things like, um, you know, is the minimum wage sufficient, to Becca's point, for people to be able to raise a family in any county in Wyoming? Uh, and we know that that answer is no. So uh, I, would, I would say that we do have some responsibility, yes, to ask people to look inward, but also our leadership should be looking outward for what are the things that we can change in order to support these people at all levels across the state. Agree that the minimum wage is one thing that could certainly be looked at, and um, you know, obviously, no one, almost no one, is um, making the state minimum wage. But um, there's still a lot of room there for us to um, to look at that and and look for solutions that would create a sustainable wage for people in Wyoming. And I think that the self sufficiency standard can help try to inform what that is. Um, the other thing that could really help with that is to um, have some protections for workers in place that um, provide the ability for them to talk about their wages um, so that they wouldn't be um, penalized by their employer, that they can't be penalized by their employer, um, you know, for discussing their wages with others. Um, so for instance, if a woman takes a job and she takes the first um, offer that she gets and doesn't realize that her coworkers are making more, um, make it safe for her to, to find that out and then to find out what is my job worth and be able to ask for that raise, um, knowing what other coworkers might be making. Um, and you know, sometimes it is, it is that someone doesn't ask for a higher wage, but um, they, you know, they need to know what is the, the correct wage for, for the work that they're doing. We have, we have many questions. Uh, happily so. So I'm maybe going to put uh, a couple together on the structure. Char, you mentioned uh, systems and structures a moment ago. So you have a question from Mary and then a question from Jennifer. I'm going to read them both together and maybe you can just respond, all of you. Mary writes, I'm curious how much the way we have structured our legislature with 20 and 40 day, 40 day intense sessions prohibit women from running. And if so, how could we restructure that in the sessions so that women could run and serve? And Jennifer asks, I'd like to hear the panel's thoughts on having a citizen legislature, and if that's a barrier specifically for women, and if so, how would you like to see it changed? Those are, those are really great questions, and one that I think the state should constantly be asking itself and reevaluating the question. There's no easy answer here, um, and I myself have thought, gosh, this would be so much easier if I had, a, this was my full-time job, I would be a, just a much more effective senator and felt like I was maybe um, be able to give 110% as opposed to the part-time legislature, which if you're not retired, then that means you're working. And so you are um, balancing your life out with um, an occupation, which is actually really quite helpful in providing that balance, believe it or not. Uh, but you know, the question of, should we have um, a full-time legislature? Ultimately, I land on the, on the no for that right now. Um, we are a very effective and a lean and mean legislature, which is really good for the people of Wyoming. Um, that also goes down to that 20 and 40 day lean and mean legislative session, which can be brutal for how much work is accomplished in such a short amount of time. Uh, I, I do think that's a hardship on families, both, both fathers and mothers, that it is a huge commitment and can be um, very disruptive to a, a family life for, for both types. 
again, I don't, I don't think right now the time is to change that. And I have considered that a, a lot personally. I think it'd be easier to space that out over time. But we're very effective to just drill down, focus in, get it done, even how painful it might be. But I'm not opposed to continuing to reevaluate whether or not that's really the best option for us. Uh, and so I think that's important. One question I want to throw out there as it relates to the part-time legislature and it really limits who can run if you have the time off or if you have a, a business like myself or I, I'm an owner of the business so I can you know, choose to leave if I want to. But one question I've had while I've been serving is there is a noted absence of retired women who have the time, who have raised their families, who have an income, that, that worked, had a career and are retired. And so a, a fundamental question I have is where are they? And why aren't they more represented here? Because they have that flexibility, theoretically. I mean, their husbands are there. Um, and they are as well, too, with their husbands supporting them. So I, I have observed, obviously, a lot of that. But a, a, a shout out to all of the retired women across the state as to where are you and why aren't you running for office? There does seem to be a preoccupation with younger women or, or younger um, politicians in general. And I push back on that a little bit, there is value and diversity in age as well. I agree with Tara. I think that there's a lot of value in the citizen legislature. Um, it's, I've, I believe that we have an advantage in Wyoming in our small population and that everybody really kind of knows everybody else, uh, or there's a very narrow margin of separation between you and people you don't know. Um, and therefore, we have a very privileged position to be to have elected officials who are deeply tied to our communities, who are living in them, doing business in them, volunteering in them, uh, serving in them in many different capacities. And uh, my perception is that those make for better legislators and those certainly make for better legislators in a small state where the impact on any one decision uh, resonates very closely to the people making those decisions. So. I don't think that we are in a place to move away from the citizen legislature. I think that would be a disservice to the people of Wyoming right now. I do think that the legislature could be doing things to make it easier for women. And I think by that, I mean, you know, we could be providing funding for childcare. Um, we could be potentially, um, let me collect my thought here because my thought train just totally went off the rails. <laughs> Um, we have systems in place, and I, I believe they're federally funded systems, where we hold jobs for people who are in the guard and are called to serve. Uh, and I don't think that it is outside the realm of possibility to consider that the state could help to pay for people for their, to hold their positions while they're serving in the legislature. I think that there's room to look at things like that so that we can continue having good citizen representation and we can you know, continue to cultivate different voices, different industry, different experiences coming into the legislature. I think one more bright spot I'd like to throw out there before we move on to the next question. That's that's a systemic thing that's po positive in Wyoming that the state did implement and that's child support services. So our Wyoming child support services, which is through the Department of Health, Department of Family Services, Wyoming Child Support Program, uh, they're phenomenal. And that service is essentially free for uh, helping all women regardless of uh, pay or, or their salaries, their own um, finances to get support in collecting child support. And I think that really helps advance the conversation for women who might be facing poverty or unique challenges as a result of wage disparity. Uh, we have a question from Allie, uh, good friend of the humanities, uh, uh, who talks about fundraising in these times. Uh, and uh, I should know in addition to what she writes in her comments, uh, we have former elected officials in the audience. We have current election officials in the audience. We have people who are running. I'm so happy to see all of these names uh, in this list. So thank you for joining us. Allie writes, fundraising is difficult for women, but especially in a time of national and local crisis. We have Senate candidates here in addition to more. Any advice for women running for US office against well-funded incumbents right now? What are some ideas for finding broad reach for their messaging and ideas? Uh, 
you just got to work. You got to work as hard as you possibly can. And you have to ask for money and you got to go door to door and you got to just work. And that's, that's the ticket. Um, the people in Wyoming, I think, want to vote for people who are willing to work and really want the position. And so we have seen just this past um, gubernatorial election that uh, money does not equate with uh, the outcome. And that is very, very important and something that um, everyone needs to just dig down and recognize that that is a truth as long as you're willing to work hard um, and show your true self that the candidates who really demonstrate that to the people will get elected. Uh, and remember, we're all in the same boat together. The economy is bad for everyone. And so everyone's fundraising is, is challenged. We're in that together too. <laughs> and I think too, <clears throat> you have to be prepared to go back and ask multiple times. Uh, people are distracted. They have a lot going on and it's, and you know, just not getting an answer the first time doesn't mean no. So my, you know, my advice for people who are fundraising is to be tenacious about it and to follow up um, as many times as it takes for someone to say, I can't help you right now, uh, or I'm not going to, um, because my experience so far in fundraising has often been that a repeat ask is helpful because the first one just falls right out of their head for whatever reason, or the letter goes on the table somewhere. So um, it is important to have a strategy and the resiliency uh, and the thick skin that it takes to go back and ask um, again and again until you get some kind of answer. And oftentimes not getting an answer the first time is very little to do with you as a candidate and much more to do with where people are in their lives right now. I agree with that. And I would also say, I mentioned um, earlier when we were talking about this, that women tend to get smaller checks than men when they're fundraising. And so don't hesitate to ask for twice as much as they say they'll give you, or you think that they'll give you. That's my advice uh, as a lawyer too. Always negotiate for more. <laughs> That's good advice. A, uh, an audience member who wishes not to be uh, identified uh, uh, writes the following. Uh, and we're not afraid of hard questions, are we, right? What about the good old boy network in Wyoming? How would you, Tara, handle that? And Brittany, how would you confront that litmus test? And I should, add, I should extend that to Becca too. But what to, what to do about what many perceive as Wyoming's political system being a quote, good old boy network? So I don't, I, you know, just no, don't fixate on perceptions or negativity. You know, so start, starting with the time I decided to run for office, um, I was, there was one white male who encouraged me to do it and then I leapt forward and did it, my, you know, and, and, and went forward and got elected. My time in the Senate was, when my first year in was supported by white men um, and they were encouraging and I was successful and things continued to move forward by my, third year in of my four year term, I was chairman of a committee, which is remarkable. And the good old boy network or whomever, you know, leadership of the Wyoming legislature made that decision to put me in a pretty coveted position as a rookie and as a woman. And they did it, I believe, for the right reasons, right? I was a good match for the position as a lawyer um, who had served on the committee and, and it, made, it made sense, right? They used logic and the right result. And that was, who did not get that position? Older white men that had been serving longer than I had. So I just wanna push back on that notion of how powerful or how negative or nefarious or difficult that good old boy network may or may not be. I'm not saying it doesn't exist and I'm not saying that there isn't um, relationships that are, um, that have developed over the course of time, and they happen to be male, that results in disadvantages to those that aren't part of those relationships or that history. Um, but I have not found it to inhibit my ability to move forward successfully in the Wyoming legislature. Again, that's not to say my experience is always rosy, but, but those are the facts that are demonstrable and proven, right? 
I'm happy, Tara, to say, hear you say towards the end of that, that it's not to say that that doesn't exist. Uh, because while I agree with you that uh, building relationships and finding the common ground uh, from which to start a conversation is the best way to overcome this problem, uh, the, there is a very real perception for people that it is a significant barrier. And for some people, that perception is a real reality. Um, my, my strategy that I think the question was, how do you overcome this? Uh, would be to fall back on sort of the thing that I have learned over the years, which works best, is to, is to build a broad coalition of people um, and to make space for many voices and start from a place where you can all agree you have a matching set of values. And I think in Wyoming, there's, you know, a, a good place to start there is just a, a deep loyalty to the state. And I think everybody here, uh, everybody in elected office definitely has an overriding goal that the future of the state and the success of its people be paramount to any of the decisions that we make. Um, I also think that people who are willing to make space or use their position of power or privilege to give the floor to other voices is a really important thing. And this is not a thing that I have seen happen very often. Uh, we have a very uh, Caucasian panel sitting here. And I think that it would be so much more robust in discussion if we had more people of color, if we had more uh, people with different ethnic backgrounds as part of this conversation. And to your point that there were a whole bunch of old white men in running for that position, there wasn't anybody else. And that is a problem. And that is something that we need to be continuing to figure out people who have the ability to make space for those voices, to set aside their position on the podium, to give it to somebody else, we need to do that. And that I think over time is gonna to help to break down some of that perception. Um, so there's a way in, but there is a way forward through it too. And I think we have to focus on both of those things. In addition to that, Brittany, having more you know, women that have our voices in the legislature um, and just more diversity in general, it makes people broaden their conversations and, and you know, not have it be just with their friends. Um, and so I, I think part of the solution, too, is to have more women run and, and be elected. I would appreciate more women in the legislature. <laughs> I, I would like to see a more equitable division of, of gender. I am calling through many, many uh, comments and questions uh, at the moment. Um, how about one to build, as I continue to look, how about one to build, are there changes to the process uh, that could be made that would help women run for office, like for DM, healthcare, childcare? And you've talked about that a little bit, but I would be, I would be interested to hear uh, specific uh, structural or procedural changes that you think might be good. And I will continue to look for more questions. Things that um, I've talked to folks about would be, well, certainly, you know, to ask women to run more often, um, but also just like things like allowing the use of campaign funds for child care expenses, um, maybe offering child care at the legislature or to, um, to cover the cost of that, um, as well as maybe offering access to health care, which you mentioned, Scott, but um, not necessarily to pay for it, but even just to offer access to that benefit as a, you know, a state employee. Um, those are some of the things that, that we've talked about. I also, um, not, I don't know a lot about this, but um, I've read that increasing the number of seats available and allowing districts to um, elect more than one representative or senator um, can be really effect, an effective way to get more women into the legislature. You know, one thing I think that we're learning right now is that a lot of the work can be done virtually. And while that 20 or 40 days in session, I think has tremendous value. And to Tara's earlier point about, you know, causing it to, for people to have to work under a deadline and have to be decisive and have to work through things quickly, I think there's a lot of value in that. 
but there is a not insignificant amount of time that legislators spend in between session where they're required to drive all over the state. And I think that, you know, necessity being what it is right now, we've quickly proven that that is not totally necessary. Uh, and I think that there are, are technological changes that we could make to some of that that would make it much more accessible for women to, to run and to serve. This is part of my direct communication style. <laughs> I urge caution. <laughs> Probably not showing the level of empathy that people would hope, but uh, just do it. Just run for office. You know, stop. It can be done. It can be done successfully. Wyoming is an easy place to run for office. There's not that many uh, barriers as far as how to do it. Um, this is your community. These are your people. This is who you are. You can run for office if that's what you want to do. Um, stop thinking about it and just do it. There is validity in that. I mean, you can, you can identify any excuse not to do it. Uh, there are things that we can do as a community and as, uh, you know, neighbors and friends to help you. But at the end of the day, it's, it's your individual decision. And, and if you want to be a leader, you're going to have to uh, put yourself out there and come to that decision on your own. So Tara, I admire that directness because I think it is a component of very solid advice. We have an excellent comment along these lines. Um, uh, so I'm going to read it and please, please comment in any way you see fit. Uh, Sylvia writes, it's a trap to think in dichotomies when it comes to gender characteristics and values. It's too simplistic. Often we're talking about that which is hyper-masculine or hyper-feminine when really there's everything in between. Balance is what's important and we should avoid the stereotypes. What would, how would you all respond to that? I just, I just think that that is so important. And it's in it, one of my undergraduate degrees from the University of Wyoming was in communication where we did study um, gender communication and the differences in between men and women and how they communicate. And how fun that is to have that conversation and really talk about those differences, uh, particularly with spouses. And it's really entertaining, right, to, to talk about that. But what the data, at least then, indicated was that men and women really don't communicate significantly differently, statistically significantly differently. Um, there are differences, of course, but the truth of the matter is we have far more similarities than differences. And that's not a surprise, I don't think, to any of the audience or the panelists. But I think that's also important um, to remember in your daily lives and deciding to run for office or come into the legislature where there is a disparity in gender. Um, it may not be as daily relevant as, as one may think or as the perception may be. Um, it, it's just not something that I am thinking about on any regular basis because it's interfering with my ability to accomplish what I want to uh, on behalf of the state. I think to Sylvia's point, I mean, that's, that's an argument that should be made about almost any issue. Uh, there is a gray, a large, large gray area for any issue. And we always tend to talk about things as though they are one way or another. Um, but it is a smart thinking person who realizes that there's an in-between thing. Um, and often I think uh, to, to come back to, you know, a point I've made over and over again, the, the, the more variation we have in voices, the greater, represent, the greater diversity of representation and experience and culture that we can have, the, the better we're going to be about not looking at things in, with that uh, dichotomous view. Uh, we are going to have people that are able to pull you into the gray and see that because all we have is our individual experience and we often need a group. Uh, hopefully a diverse group to help us see things that are far more nuanced than we can manifest, you know, in a, in a small group of like-minded people. I would, yeah, I would agree that, that there's certainly, um, there's a, di you know, a real range of, of, of um, people's personalities. And I mean, I personally know just as many guys that are, um, don't have the confidence that they'd like, or, um, you know, they're not assertive. And I know a lot of women who are assertive and direct. Um, but I would also say that it does seem to be those 
men with assertiveness and directness that are represent overrepresented in some of these leadership positions, right? And so I think um, they tend to push their way maybe into those positions and have the confidence to do that. And so um, it's not necessarily that we're saying that those other folks don't exist, but they just may not be as visible and their voice isn't as loud. So I think listening more, um, which Brittany, I think you're getting to is, is important. Several questions here uh, about our history and how, how to deal with it. Um, uh, Donald points out that maybe one of the reasons for a citizen legislature meeting when it does uh, is the importance of ranchers being elected historically to our legislature. Uh, Mary also points out the fact uh, that we're called the equality state, but that original act of legislative equality was for white women and not necessarily for women of color and for native women. So how, uh, there's several questions there. And the, the broad thing is how, how to deal with all of the history that have led to the structures and the results that we have now. So an important historical fact is that when Wyoming passed equality in 1869, it also was across the races. Um, that's true, it did not apply to the Native Americans within the state. That's because they weren't citizens at that time. So, but the uh, Blacks and the other races that were coming to Wyoming after the Civil War and coming out to the territory, they were given the right to vote, just like white women. And part of the reason why the women were was because black men received the right to vote at the national level. And so it was, it was, a, it was a national conversation occurring. Wyoming was a part of that. Um, I believe we passed the vote for the right reason and I'm happy to discuss that with anyone. But I think that's an important fact to remember. It is true that Native Americans did not get the right to vote at that time, but the reason for that was they weren't citizens. They were we were still navigating th their role in the new frontier. You know, I've really struggled with this this year because you you grow up in a state called the Equality State with a very proud history of a lot of very progressive things for women. Um, but like this year's legislative session felt to me like women's voices were not heard at all. And I'm speaking from my own, you know, my own point of view here. Um, but when, when we are denying healthcare access to people who are, you know, largely women because they're working low wage jobs, and when we're, when we're seeking to take away reproductive rights for them, and when we vote down a, a bill that helps overcome our gender wage gap, this feels very anti-woman to me. And it's all done during the same year that we're celebrating suffrage and all of the progress for women at a time when we have the least amount of female representation in our state that we've had for decades. So I don't have the solution to this. Uh, I'm just sort of trying to express like the way that I feel about this. Uh, I am, you know, fifth generation. Uh, I, I, I'm raising the sixth. This is the place that I feel very deeply is my home and I feel very connected to this state. But on this topic, I have felt very disconnected uh, during this period of time. I feel as though uh, we are honoring a history in words only, but not in action. And I'm curious, you know, maybe what the other panelists think about that. Well, I would push my, my forward communication style coming through there, Tara. I had something to say about that. <laughs> There's a lot of motivations for why um, and reasons why bills come forward and why they pass and fail. And I don't think it's accurate um, to label all of those reasons as being um, gender discriminatory or with the intention of marginalizing women. Certainly that can be perceived to be um, an impact, an unintended impact perhaps. 
but those issues, you know, Medicaid expansion, I think is the reference. Um, the concerns associated with that topic are robust. And I think all 90 legislators have a different uh, rationale either for or against it. And I think it's important to know that it's very complex and that particular issue affects both men and women, the working poor, right? The 20,000 working poor within our state. Um, and, and so there are a lot of complications associated with it, right? Primarily, I would say that the legislature's hesitation for it is financial and that they can't, uh, that, that there's a belief that the state cannot sustain it, whether or not um, you agree with that or the panelists agree with that. My, my understanding from most of my colleagues is the hesitation for passing that has to do with um, financial concerns. Um, certainly right now that becomes more apparent, right, as the state is facing even more dire financial um, future than it has historically. And so those realities are very real as opposed to just policy centered. You know, there are, there are what I call perennial bills every year dealing with some of those more passionate issues in this country. Um, those are happening all across the nation. I think they will continue to happen and um, they are important to much of, of the state on both sides. And so we as legislators need to continue to have those hard conversations, but just be mindful that um, there are both sides on those issues that find them very important and that's why they continue to appear. Um, thanks for that. And of course, Medicaid expansion is one thing that, um, you know, I think could it really impact a lot of low income women, um, especially because women are overrepresented in the low income bracket. Um, but just in general, this session, um, there, it being a budget session, there weren't as many bills um, addressing some of the issues that, that um, you know, could, could be addressed to help women's um, rights and economic self-sufficiency. And there were, a, I think, a record number of bills this year in a, such a short time, um, which makes it really challenging as well. Um, and so some of them didn't, you know, that, for instance, that I was following didn't even get heard, um, which is a challenge. So I don't know if you can speak to that, Tara, but um, is there any kind of um, mechanism in place to limit the number of bills or um, kind of uh, some way to make more bills, some bills be more of a priority than others? And how does that, how would that work? Yeah, so um, the number of bills this past budget session, there are a lot of pushback and negativity and criticism of the legislature. And I too will push back on that. Your citizen legislature is working very hard. All of those bills took time. And I would submit to you that the majority of those were constituent driven bills that serve as the voice of the people. And so there is um, a, a hard balance that needs to be struck between managing the legislature's time and being a voice for the people. And we speak for the people through legislation and through bills. And if we look historically at the number of bill drafts, we can see them increase and decrease along with recessions. And so what that should signal to you positively is that in times of recession, the people who you elect to serve are working harder to come up with solutions to make your world better, either economically or otherwise. And that is why there's an increase in bills. It should be a good sign that the legislature is working very hard. That said, there are a number of bills that get um, a, too much attention that may not be moving the needle in a way that we want to effectively. Uh, there might be other reasons for the bills that cause them to fail. Um, it may be just that the other 89 other legislators didn't like it. And so they speak for their constituents as well. And that's part of the democracy at play. And so I think it's very important to respect the work that's been done. Um, encourage your legislator to have reasonable expectations of them too. Do you want them driving bills? Um, the Senate has limitations on its bill drafts. The House typically does not. Um, at the end of the day, it seems to work, even though it can be pretty, pretty messy in the process. We are, we are coming up on our time. 
so one thing that I want to do is to uh, read a comment from Sean, with which many people agree, including Gail. And Sean writes, we need thoughtful leaders who make space for many voices. Thanks to this panel for being critical thinkers. Many people in the comments uh, agree with that. And I also want to say to people listening, uh, please continue to write your comments into the chat. Even if we don't get to them, uh, I'll save the chat and we can include all of that information with the video that we will post later to our YouTube feed. Um, so maybe one more, one more question uh, or comment. Help us, you three, please, to look forward. We are, we are in a world now that is much changed. Um, and it's probably a bad expectation for the world to return in every single way to the way it was. So in what ways can we adapt? In what ways can we adjust? In what ways can we call upon our history and the best ideas that we've had in order to look forward and to navigate our way through what is now a much changed world, please. We're all getting our crystal balls out here to answer this question. We desperately need you to answer yeah. this question. Uh, I, will, I will tackle it a little bit. Um, you always have to figure out a place from which to start. And I think that that uh, is oftentimes the hardest thing. Like, where do you take the first step? Uh, and for me, I would say we need to look at who we are in Wyoming as a people. What is the things that have defined us uh, for the history of our statehood? And how have we used those characteristics to our advantage? Um, and some of those things are, have been referenced many times today. Uh, a resiliency, a grit, a sort of determination uh, that I think really does set people in Wyoming apart. Uh, but there is also that intimate degree of connectedness that we, that we have as a luxury in this state, despite the fact that we're spread out geographically so far. So that is a long way of getting around to my saying um, that I think the thing that is most important is that we stay connected to each other and that we stay uh, supportive of each other and our neighbors and that we're investing in our people as much as we can because it is people that are gonna take this to the next level. Those are the, it is supported people who have the networks, who have the relationships, who have systems in place to meet their basic needs that are then going to be able to help us take, uh, take the next steps. It's not incumbent upon elected officials or leaders in any role to define the, all of the things that will, will move us into the future. But I think it is, uh, it is on us to make sure that we make space for people who have those ideas and have those voices and have that passion and can take us in that direction. I liked what you said about having the systems in place um, for our citizens to, um, to thrive. And, um, you know, in this really challenging time, I know that um, we're going to be facing some really, our, our state's going to be facing some really, really hard decisions. And just coming out of the budget session and, and having to potentially go back and, um, and redo the budget or, you know, make some more decisions based on the, the current um, circumstances. Um, I would encourage two things. First of all, um, you know, and this isn't just for now, but for, for always, the citizens um, to get engaged with that process. And um, it's, as someone, you know, who's not in the legislature, it is kind of a confusing thing to really get up to speed on to understand and to stay up to date on because it moves so quickly. Um, you know, trying to, to follow multiple bills that are in the House and the Senate. Um, it is a challenge, but it is really necessary, especially since we do have a citizen le legislature and they don't have staff people, like for, uh, for them to know what's going on in our communities. And um, for those of you who are experts in your field, um, or just want to let them know what's going on back at home, I think it's really necessary to have your voice heard. 
Um, and then the other thing is to, to take to make use of the tools that are in place. And I would um, mention again the the Women's Foundation and the Wyoming Council for Women put together the self sufficiency calculator tool, which um, I think can be really useful as a decision making tool right now, um, just to know what is it that our folks need to survive in these really tough times. Those are really great comments, uh, and I appreciate both of them and think that they are spot on. You know, for me, looking back at our history, I'm a big believer that in our past lies our future. And in Wyoming, I'm always hopeful for that because I'm so proud of our history, most of it. We have some dark spots too. Again, uh, I'm not that Pollyanna. But what do we know about ourselves, right? We have survived in the territory. We chose to settle in a high altitude climate surviving the environment, um, surviving strangers, surviving a trail, surviving disease, surviving poverty. And that's how, that's our roots, right? That's where we started. This is where we choose to be. We're fighters from the very beginning. Um, we survived a pandemic before. We've survived world wars. Uh, we've survived worse financial times. Believe it or not, the state has been in much more serious financial conditions historically than we are now. And so I am confident when I look at this panel and I look at the 36 to 38 participants that are listening in, wanting to learn, wanting to experience, wanting to lean in um, and be part of the future and to see what they can do. I am confident we will weather this storm like we always have. Uh, I know that there is the right leadership in the state um, from elected officials to those that are providing the data-driven results through a sustainability study, through the university, um, and all of our other resources that are really genuinely trying to survive and make this an equitable place where we want to raise our children and continue to thrive. And I know that we will do it because we're all here tonight making it happen. And I very much appreciate that the three of you are here. Uh, please, if you have uh, closing thoughts or want to uh, respond to something uh, you heard, uh, welcome, and then I will, uh, uh, and then I will bring us to a close. Please. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, and it's um, been great to hear the thoughts of the other panelists as well. I think you know what what we've seen here tonight is just sort of a, a sort of small sampling of what is possible in terms of the kinds of dialogue that can be had around this state, uh, and that is encouraging to me. Watching the the great things going on in the chat, I mean, we just have such thoughtful, engaged, inspired people. Uh, I'm grateful to be uh, part of this discussion and part of uh, knowing many of these people. Uh, and I think that that speaks well to the future of Wyoming and I'm and I'm glad that uh, we're all able to gather like this and have these kinds of conversations. A wonderful opportunity that I really am grateful for to be here with these incredible panelists and in this this chat dialogue and these questions. Um, clearly critical thinkers all around. Our, our state is in good hands with a bright future. And I, I am grateful for tonight, particularly in these challenging times. So, so thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you all three. Tara Nethercott, Becca Smith, Brittany Walsh. Thank you so much. Uh, and please everyone, each Thursday night, the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research has these think and drink talks at 5.30. Uh, we're recording them now for anyone who wishes to watch them later. Uh, but please do join us and thank you once again, you three, really, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you.